Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this session on climate crisis, climate justice, and child protection. When I was a child back in the 80s, these apocalyptic images of the climate crisis were only in science fiction, scary movies, or books, something that is not supposed to happen and that was only there to feed our fears when watching these movies or reading these books. Today, these images aren't sci-fi anymore. They are the reality of too many children across the world. When fiction has joined reality, it is terrifying. We cannot anymore look the other way and ignore the urgency of the situation. Wildfires, floods, droughts, famine, water scarcity are among a few of the dangers we have in front of us. Plastic and fast fashion landfills across the globe have become the new landscape of a whole generation of children. The COVID-19 global pandemic taught us that more and more we will be facing global challenging problems and the climate crisis is definitely the one we are already facing. Children around the world have and are being born in this crisis. Those children living in humanitarian setting are among the most affected. And this is the reason why, as part of the 2021-2025 strategic plan, the Alliance is already looking forward to addressing the climate crisis, climate justice and child protection. Today's session will hopefully help us to set up the scene and kick off the discussion we will be having moving forward regarding what the child protection sector can do in the coming years and how the Alliance can support this. We will have the pleasure to hear from youth from diverse horizons, as not only they are the first concerned by this discussion, but as well, they have wisely come together and created a movement we shouldn't we should not only listen to, but maybe follow. We will also learn more about some work already happening in several contexts, and we will have the opportunity to brainstorm together. But first of all, we have the pleasure to welcome Mrs. Otani, the UNCRC Chair, and Mr. Castiglianos, the Under Secretary General for IFRC for some opening remarks. Mrs. Otani, please, thank you for being with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Alliance for giving me the opportunity to speak at this special session on the climate change at your fifth anniversary annual meeting. It is very timely as both of the Alliance and the Committee on the Rights of the Child now recognize and highlight the climate change as a key child rights issue for our respective work. Climate change is exacerbating the impacts of disasters as it increases the frequency and severity of weather and climate hazards. The scientific evidence has pointed to increase in the frequency, magnitude, and duration of extreme weather events, such as heat waves, drought, and associated wildfires, heavy rain, and coastal flooding due to the increased greenhouse gases driving the climate change. Climate change are also significant interrelated contributors to the world experiencing political and economic instability, growing inequality, declining food and water security, and increased threats to health and livelihood. Children are more affected by the climate crisis. Compared to adults, children require more food and water per unit of their body weight, are less able to survive extreme weather events and are more susceptible to toxic chemical, chemicals, temperature changes and diseases among other factors. Also, while all children are exceptionally vulnerable to climate change, children with disabilities, children on the move, children living in poverty, children separated from their families and the youngest are most at risk. It is reported that climate change will cause an additional 60,000 and 48,000 deaths from malaria and the diarrheal diseases, respectively, among children and under 15 by 2030. 
it will be responsible for an additional 95,000 deaths from undernutrition in children aged under five by 2030, and an additional 24 million undernourished children by 2050. It is also reported that every year, no less than 1.5 million under the age of five years die as a result of air pollution, water pollution, exposure to toxic sub substances, and other types of environmental harm. By increasing the incidence of asthma, diabetes, and cancer, among other medical conditions, these factors also contribute to disease, disability, and early mortality throughout the life of children. Further shocking figure was reported this summer. The UNICEF Children's Risk Index launched in August revealed that approximately 1 billion children, near half of near half the world's 22 billion children are at extremely high risk of the impacts of the climate crisis. These are the children who live in one of the 33 countries classified at extremely high risk. Facing a deadly combination of exposure to multiple climate and environmental shocks, such as flooding, cyclones, vector borne diseases, lead pollution, heat waves, water, scarcity and air pollution. With a high vulnerability due to the inadequate essential services, such as water sanitation, healthcare and education. Furthermore, the UNICEF alerted that the figure, uh, figures like likely get worse as the impacts of climate change accelerate. All these adverse effects of a climate crisis on children undermine their well-beings and the full and effective enjoyment of whole range of their rights. The UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights notes that the negative impact of climate change threatens children's rights to health, life, food, water, and sanitation, education, housing, culture, and development, among others. The Committee on the Rights of the Child in its report of the 2016 Day of General Discussion on Children's Rights and the Environment notes that climate change can aggravate underlying causes of serious violations through conflict over limited resources, increased, increased forced migration, and even child marriage. Recognizing the increasing importance and urgency of climate crisis as child rights issue, the committee decided to produce a new general comment on children's rights and the environment with a special focus on climate change. So what is the general comment? This is the document the committee adopts to provide authoritative guidance to state parties on implementing their obligations concerning specific articles or themes under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The new general comment number 26 is aimed to provide guidance to the state parties on child rights approach to environmental issues, including climate change. More, spe more specifically, it aims to clarify such issues as what are the state's obligations to take legislative, administrative, and other measures to ensure children's rights in relation to climate change, and how children should be able to exercise their rights to information, participation, and access to justice to be protected from the harm of climate change. Whether and how relevant would this general comment be to the work of humanitarian actors working for child protection. What can you expect from this new general comment? Whether and how can you contribute to the general comment? All these questions are interrelated. The general comment clarifies the state obligations, provides guidance and recommendation to the states, which will be also used as guidance by UN agencies, NGOs, professionals working for or with children in their respective work. Or as an advocacy tool, or the common guidance point in developing legislation, policy, and programs with the governments. So what kind of guidance the general comment will provide should be interest to you. The general comment are not legally binding documents per se, and thus the inputs based on the evidence, data, experiences, and practices provided by the experts, academia, professionals, pr practitioners, 
working on the themes are crucial to strengthen the normative and practical value of the general comment. The UN Climate Action website says, the climate crisis is a humanitarian crisis. The UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Mark Lowcock, at the webinar, The Climate Crisis and the Humanitarian Need, Taking Action to Support the World's Most Vulnerable commun Communities in April this year, highlighted some priorities and stressed that researchers and organizers in the most vulnerable countries will have far more innovative and wide ideas than I for how to mitigate and adapt to the risk of the climate changes, and the world should listen to them. I see here the strong case for synergies, complementarities, and potential collaboration between the work of the Committee on the Rights of the Child and the Alliance in this area of child protection and climate change. In particular, I'd like to highlight the particular interest of the committee to hear and integrate the view of the children and youth in drafting process of the general comment. Yet, it is always a challenge for us to reach out the children and the young in the most vulnerable situation, such as in humanitarian situation. I believe that the committee may be able to benefit from your alliance in this regard. Finally, I would also like to emphasize that adopting the general comment is one of the uh, activities. The core mandated activity of the committee is monitoring the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child by states through review the country reports. While drafting the general comment, the committee continues to review country reports. The country review is another opportunity for you to make contribution to the work of the committee in the country specific context. I hope that the discussion today will lead to further discussions on the potential collaboration between the committee and the Alliance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Izutani. And actually, your, your, I mean, your, your opening remarks are very, uh, very important to us. Uh, the numbers that you have given are terrifying. Uh, but I think I can speak on the behalf of the Alliance and say we are as well very much looking forward uh, to uh, seeing this opportunity to collaborate together um, and create those synergies around child rights, child protection and, and climate issues. So thank you so much for your, your intervention. We know how busy you are and it has been a real pleasure to, to have you today. Thank you. Um, I will turn now to uh, Mr. Castellanos, and apology if I don't say your name right, uh, uh, the Under uh, Secretary General for IFRC, Mr. Castellanos, the floor is yours and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Audrey, and you pronounced it uh, perfectly well. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for this invitation and please accept my gratitude for this opportunity. Congratulations to, to the Alliance for organizing this successful uh, annual meeting and congratulations for its excellent new strategy that includes climate related emergencies. As you, uh, as you all know well, and we have heard a very excellent uh, presentation from Mexico, climate related emergencies are escalating and intensifying in each part of the world. Just in the last year, we have experienced record-setting fires, the most intense hurricanes in a generation, flooding, washing away homes and livelihoods and severe droughts. And this year, it continues the same. It's growing and is a reality that is affecting more and more uh, people across the world. Essentially, Climate-related disasters are a threat um, uh, multiplier, making existing vulnerabilities worse, more intense, and harder to manage. Of course, these disasters do not impact uh, everyone equally. Those with resources and power are better able to shield themselves to some degree. But those people who are already disadvantaged and struggling are the ones who are impacted the most. 
also what we know is many of them live in areas that are hardest to, harder to reach. Among this population, children are particularly at risk, especially girls who already face so many inequalities. Also children who are displaced, children connected to the streets or in a labor work, living with disabilities or who are indigenous or marginalized. The impact of climate change is beyond disasters. The consequences of the impact on individuals, families and communities is also reflected in the social dynamics, financial pressures that put also children with increased levels of stress at home and often resulting in aggressive and violent behaviors. Children dropping out from the school during emergency are unlikely to go back, but rather get involved in child labor. Child marriage also becomes a coping mechanism for many families seeing no option to survive. Children have not caused the problems, but they are the most affected. Climate shocks threaten the development and even survival of many and will do, will do so for decades to come. Based on these realities, I would offer three observations from our work in the field and consultation with children. And of course, these are one perspective uh, and you will have much more to add. The first one, we need systems that are fit for purpose. We need to invest on our understanding of how climate risk impact children and develop evidence-based solutions in anticipation of disaster events but also as an opportunity to work with children in creative adaptation solutions. Similarly, address changing climate risk in preparedness, response, and recovery. It, for this, working collaboratively across the humanitarian sector and beyond is needed. The meaningful and inclusive participation and leadership of local actors and people we serve is absolutely key if we want to achieve significant changes. We urgently need to step up the humanitarian response to growing needs and help people adapt to a growing impact of climate crisis. Through consultations with hundreds of experts and many of your agencies, the Red Cross Red Crescent Movement has developed the Climate and Environment Charter for humanitarian organizations, giving us the direction on how to do this uh, as a system, to this system to change and to contribute to reduce the impact of the climate change. The second, we need to elevate child protection. In our actions, we cannot leave our, our children protection. More and more, we see good progress in recognizing that children's rights are under threat for climate emergencies, and yet, the risk of violence, abuse, and exploitation still needs to be better highlighted. We have seen this ourselves through a series of IFRC studies named We Need to Do Better on Climate Change, Child Protection, and Local Action. Part of the problem is we do not allow a space for children to have a voice. As adults, we might forget, but children are the experts about children. Through the We Need to Do Better studies, we have heard over 30,000 children. And children are concerned about protection and mental health risk during climate emergencies. Children do not feel they have child-friendly information to access protection services uh, in emergencies. And children are not confident that adults, adults will properly help them. This is our failure as adults, and we must find practical ways to seek children's counsel, make room for their leadership, and partner with children on local solutions. We urgently need their brilliance and passion, and that brilliance and passion also will allow us to change as an adult. The third point, we need to anticipate and act early for children. A response to child protection in emergencies is often too slow and reactive. Protection is added to a response after the cyclone, flood, or fire, 
With this in mind, we need to invest more in preparedness. Anticipatory action is an emerging tool for us all, although right now child protection is invisible in anticipatory actions. So now is the time for us to include child protection to, into anticipatory actions so we act early. Take prevention steps and better protect children when climate emergencies do happen. To help move this forward, we have just released a new issue brief on anticipatory action and child protection with help from friends, including the child protection area of responsibility. Although we have an enormous and complicated problem, as we see here today with all of you, we have motivation to get results. To get the best results, we will need a patient and generous team effort. Now is the time for us to bring together the different pieces of knowledge we all have and develop a unified agenda. The IFRC and its national societies, its network of more than, uh, than 174,000 local offices in 190, 192 countries stands with you. We stand, uh, stand ready to work with you uh, uh, and also we continue serving to protect each child affected by climate related emergencies. Together, we will do better. And I hope that this gathering will allow us to find those synergies to build and continue creating the necessary steps to address a common problem that we want to address. So many thanks and back to you. Thank you so much. And I do agree with you. Together, we can rise to this challenge. And, uh, and I'm very happy as well to see this high number of people today who have joined this discussion. Because as you said, if we come together as a community and we start acting now, we would be able to better protect children moving forward. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Castellanos. And, uh, and we look forward to continuing the discussion with you and our collaboration as the Alliance. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so um, that was, that were two very inspiring uh, interventions and we are very lucky as the Alliance uh, to, to have those uh, two guests joining us today to help us kicking off this discussion and, and setting the scene moving forward. Um, we are got now going to have a quick glance at uh, the, the climate crisis, climate justice and child protection uh, section of the uh, strategic plan. Uh, so you, because we have released the plan just two days ago, I'm sure you have already read it uh, with you know, uh, curiosity and appetite, but anyway, we thought it would be important um, to, to have a quick look at it uh, together. So as, as explained uh, on Wednesday, uh, we, we have an, an overarching goal within our 2021-2025 strategic plan for the Alliance with four main priorities, which are accountability, localization, multi-sector um, approach and prevention. And then as you can see uh, on, on this graph, we have as well already still link uh, to the overarching goal, moving, looking ahead, uh, climate crisis, climate justice and child protection. Next slide, please. Um, so as, as we have been all saying since we started that discussion, uh, the climate crisis is, is the current crisis uh, and it's gonna be almost the ultimate test uh, for, for all of us and it will affect uh, children, whether we, we manage a collective action or unfortunately inaction. Next slide, please. Uh, before moving forward, what is important to, to, to take into consideration is that this climate crisis, uh, climate justice and child protection section under 
under the, the strategic plan, it's not there just like that. It is as well linked very much to our overarching goal and priorities, because it's gonna be important to center the child, uh, the children in our rep response uh, and looking at their protection needs. Um, and to do so, as, um, as it has been said, coming together, working together, but working together as a community, but working together as well with other sectors uh, is gonna be essential. There are a certain number of things that we can already do to prevent further harm to children. And, and as well, what is gonna be important is to be able to look at uh, locally based um, answers and response uh, moving forward. So we, we don't have yet necessarily, you know, defined activities and priorities. And, and this session today, as, as we said, is, is a way to kind of start the discussion as, as a sector and, and coming together. But we still have a few questions, uh, overarching ones. Uh, what does the climate crisis mean for child protection and the future of the humanitarian action? Um, and how we can, you know, uh, ensure that uh, climate financing supports child and youth and community-led initiatives, um, among other other things. Um, next one, please. Um, we we have as well a few questions when it comes to climate action for child rights protection and well-being. Uh, what is fantastic is, I guess, part of the discussion we may want to have moving forward is how we can join forces, how we can work, uh, you know, for example, to support the general comment uh, Mrs. Otani was referring to, how really we can come together and, and, and join our forces. I'm not going to read all the questions because we will invite you to obviously go back to the strategic plan, take the time to read it, take the time to digest and make, and make the linkages as well with all those uh, different priorities and section because nothing has been written in silo within our strategy. It's, it's obviously everything is interlinked together. Next one, please. And then there is, uh, there is as well what we can do action on social responsibility and re reducing the child protection sector impact on the environment. So moving forward, is there anything that we can do as well as, as individual and as a sector to be a little bit more um, greener? Uh, and so when we, when we will be working to protect children to make sure that you know, we, we act as well in a way that, uh, that is uh, preserving uh, climate. Next slide, is, if there is any. So we, we are thinking of having uh, a few actions um, and as well a few activities. Uh, these activities will um, will be better defined moving forwards. Um, we're thinking, for example, to kind of uh, bring people together, having potentially uh, a group uh, discussion, maybe an initiative moving forward that will specifically focus on uh, climate. Uh, crisis, climate justice, and child protection. And we are hoping again, I sound a little bit repetitive today, but that uh, the discussion that we are initiating today um, will continue moving forward to start with, but also uh, will help us to uh, better frame what will be the actions and the activities that the Alliance uh, and the child sector can do uh, when it comes to climate crisis and child protection. I stop there. I'll definitely invite you um, to read uh, the strategic plan, uh, to get familiar, uh, to see as well the link with the different priorities, the overarching goal and the climate crisis, climate justice and, and child protection. Um, I'm fully aware I haven't, give, I haven't given justice to this particular session, but uh, we have a full program this afternoon uh, with a lot of discussion ahead and, and as well some, uh, some guests uh, joining us, especially for this event. So um, I will stop now um, and I will hand over to uh, Jonas Maheto, uh, youth advocate working for IRFRC. 
who will be moderating our uh, youth panel discussion. Uh, Jonas Maheto is uh, joining us from Tanzania. Good afternoon, Jonas. Are you with us? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. C can you hear me, Audrey? Yes. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, my name is Jonas, is introduced by Audrey um, in Tanzania. I'm a member of the IFRC Youth Commission and I'm child protection activist. And I'm very much happy to be moderating this session. So I warmly welcome you today in this session. I hope it will be interactive as we have um, a panelist which is composed of um, uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, young ladies and young uh, men. Therefore, be attentive uh, to listen to them. Um, and later on, there'll be a session for asking questions, Q&A. Therefore, you have a time for Q&A. And allow me now to introduce our dear panelist. The first panelist is uh, Faisanul Ali. Faisanul Ali is an uh, environmental activist. Uh, is in uh, is living in Somalia and he's from Somalia. Uh, he has been an activist since his childhood and. He will share uh, his experience and his success stories uh, in child protection, environmental, and climate crisis. A round of applause to Faisal Noor, please, wherever you are, clap your hands. Yes, again, we have uh, Priyanka Lala. Priyanka Lala is an environmental activist, child rights advocate uh, from Portugal, Spain. Trinidad and Tobago. A round of applause to Priyanka Lala. And the last panelist uh, is Nadine Clopton. Nadine Clopton is a committed a young lady. Uh, he's youth activist, a climate activist, and actually he's a youth representative uh, to the UN nation for caring, living as neighbors, and as the founder of Conscious Consulting LLC. And she serves as the vice president on the youth representative to the United Nations. You are welcome, Nadine. Hands, clap your hands for Nadine. As you have heard uh, from our uh, previous uh, speakers, they had remarks regarding the uh, children, uh, protection, the climate change and the climate crisis. Uh, they have given us insights about the effects of climate change and climate crisis, uh, that children are more susceptible. Uh, children who are living in climate uh, crisis areas, they are more susceptible and they are adversely affected by this climate. Uh, therefore, uh, starting from Pfizer and all, uh, I would like to know uh, about yourself and your experience in climate change activism. Hi everyone. It's such a great honor and pleasure to be with you and to participate in important session on climate change. Uh, my name is Faisal Ainte, uh, son of Nurala Ainte. Uh, if a brief introduction of me, if I really say something about my life on climate change, I remember uh, personally, uh, my dad was a gardener. Uh, he used to work with UNISOM in 1994 when the UN came to Somalia to help as a gardener. So I grew up in an environment where my family carries the, the the environment much in a home where there is a lot of gardening we used to really uh, at the young age we used to nourish the garden to learn a lot about the environment so uh, 
uh, I really started my life from there. I, I remember when I was at high school, I, of course, run a campaign, a plantation campaign as a, a school leader, uh, planting forty trees a uh, uh, weekend by, uh, by students. So uh, then I really joined a the university, then I have learned a lot about the environment. Uh, and of course, participated in some local conferences on the environment. Uh, understanding a lot about the environment, it get really sometimes, get, of course, it was giving me uh, to get, I mean, to really uh, emphasize the environment. Uh, then I co founded a, of a, a plant, I mean, a plant project organization that really plants trees and protects the environment. Uh, uh, I like I at that time. Then I uh, try to advocate the environment to the government to uh, bring alternative energy, and then of course to focus the environment. Uh, oh, uh, thank you, thank you, Faiza, yeah. for introductory remarks. Uh, you started a long time since uh, young uh, when you had uh, gardening at your home. Congratulations. Uh, Priyanka you. Lala, uh, can you introduce yourself and how, tell us, how did you start working in climate crisis issues? Yes, thank you for this question and thank you for having me and for including the Youth Voice today. My name is Priyanka Lala, I'm 15 years old and I live in Trinidad and Tobago. I became UNICEF's Youth Advocate for the Eastern Caribbean when I was 14. I'm also a Child Rights Ambassador and I advocate for zero waste living through my zero waste blog, Zero Waste Life. I took the privilege of living in this beautiful part of the world for granted until I saw the devastating impacts of Hurricane Irma and Maria when they hit in 2017. It caused widespread destruction in several islands in the region. And when I was speaking up about the use of plastic since I was 10 at my school, it was really Hurricane and Maria and Irma that started my journey and allowed me to adapt to climate change. And until today, it drives everything that I do. I'm continuously thinking of what I can do to change the way that I live. And my priority as a UNICEF youth advocate is to speak up about the issues that affect children and young people in my region. And the issues that I'm most passionate about are education, health, especially non-communicable diseases, child abuse, child protection, and of course, climate change. And one of my most recent initiatives, for example, is Eat Green, Live Bloom because non-communicable diseases is a major issue affecting the lives of children and young people in my country and the region. I designed this initiative to address healthier eating habits and to demonstrate how we can also protect and preserve our environment by eating green. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Rala. Uh, of course, we will eat green. <laughs> uh, Nadine, uh, we have heard uh, Faisa and the Priyanka about their stories and their history. Can you tell us about yourself and your history and experience in climate change activism? Yes, hello everyone and thank you so much gratitude for being able to be in this space with you all today and uh, gratitude to Faisal and Priyanka for sharing their stories as well. It's really an honor to be here. Um, so I grew up in Pennsylvania in the US on the unceded homelands of the Lenny Lenape people. I've been in the advocacy space for about six years now as an NGO youth representative to the United Nations. Um, and I, I owe an extraordinary debt of gratitude to my indigenous brothers and sisters. I have learned the most from their scholarship, from their stories, from their work. Um, and I've also learned the most from our mother earth and her natural cycles. So from getting my hands into the soil and learning the, the wisdom that's really held within each of the creatures that we share our planet with has been such a profound experience in my own life. Um, but I'm, I'm personally deeply passionate about, in the words of the great Joanna Macy, being a stone in the bridge between worlds. Um, my vision is to serve as a catalyst for new international frameworks and systems rooted in heart-centered wisdom and a care ethic where communities and ecosystems and children are at the center beyond the scope of countries in order to ensure that no voices are left out of international discourse and agenda setting. 
I hope to co-create a world in which GDP is no longer the standard measure of well-being, but where social, environmental, and psycho-spiritual well-being take precedence. Um, I hold a, a Master of Arts in Environmental Policy Design from Lehigh University, and currently I'm serving as a Vice President on the Global NGO Executive Committee as an Associate at the International Institute for Child Rights and Development. I see Laura here with us. Hi, Laura. Um, and as a NGO Youth Representative to the UN for Clan Child Health and Non-Communicable Disease and Health Equity Focused um, NGO. Um, in the climate space, I founded the Global Youth Climate Action Declaration core team and the uh, Localizing Climate Justice Conference series. Um, and currently, which is one of my, my favorite projects, I'm directing strategic development for Emergence of Heart, which is a film using a feel to heal approach to the climate crisis while weaving together critical reflections on identity, age, whiteness, colonization, gender, and responsibility. So it's really an, and a privilege to be with you here today. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you are really passionate in the environment. We, we see from your, from your story. Uh, Priyanka Lala, in your, um, uh, in your activism, and in your, um, uh, uh, you can say the, 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 the whole process of turning the world into green, uh, to be green. Have you ever encountered any barrier or challenges during your um, climate change activism? Yes, thank you for this question. Well, climate change is my passion and it's where my advocacy started. I started blogging about zero waste living and how we can adopt simple strategies to reduce our carbon footprint. I strongly believe that every small step will add up to great impact. And the challenges that I face is the acceptance of my message. It seems that no one really understands the urgency, including my peers and even policymakers and the government is lagging behind. The topic of climate change is not on the minds of the majority who are not affected. This is a tragedy because in my country, year after year, Many are affected by the harmful impact of climate change, drought, flash flooding, hurricanes, landslides, SLRs, and coastal erosion. It is usually the same communities that are affected and then they repeat, yet no real attempts are made towards meaningful progress in preventative action. And this has not deterred me because I think they will eventually understand but there's not enough time to wait as we must act now. Sometimes I think that they need to hear from someone who is more popular, like a celebrity or someone who's famous to just follow, but even so, when local celebrities speak up, it is not sustainable. The messages are just one-liners about littering, for example, but there is no sustainable plan to follow through. And this is why I try to interview other advocates like myself from around the world who show that there are many others, young people, children, working on this mission. And I think that if we share our stories with others and, the climate, and that climate change must be tackled in solidarity, it will encourage others to join me on this mission and others like myself. And I'm continuously working on new initiatives to reach wider audiences and connect with young people as well as CSOs that work in youth and with, with youth in my country and in my region. And UNICEF has really played a major role in endorsing and helping me get my message across. But I think unless I get others to start talking about climate change and climate justice, believing in its urgency and taking action, the time to do so will run out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing us your barriers and of course the recommendations within it. Before going to Pfizer, uh, I would like to remind that there will be a question and answer session at the end. Therefore, kindly uh, put your question in the Zoom chat box, uh, or you can continue to add them in the group map uh, so that later on we can pick some of the, of the question. Uh, Faisanur, uh, in, have you ever encountered any challenges uh, or uh, uh, barriers in your climate change activism? We know you are doing so much in Somalia. Any challenges have you faced? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your question, really. Uh, yeah, of course, there is a lot of really challenges that, uh, that we really activists face uh, during uh, 
of course our activities that we are doing uh some of the of course some of the uh, uh some of the priorities that we really face uh is like a security one of the main things that really we face now is a security because we will really try to uh, plant plant really trees when we uh you know when we really want to try to plant trees in the place where the de degraded uh land degradation is is occurring a lot is a place where the where where the extremists is, is controlled. So it's really very hard to reach that place and to really plant uh, trees. Uh, 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 what, um, that was the main things, that was the, the, the important things that we really face. And the second thing is that uh, lack of capacity, lack of capacity. It, uh, uh, there is really, uh, I mean, a, a capacity that lack of capacity of the organizations that of course really needs to uh, have a lot of environmental activities in, or someone who really knows the knowledge and, uh, uh, and it's experts that could really of course tackle the, the challenge uh, if it's financial or if it is uh, uh, expert knowledge which has the knowledge of, of environment is another barrier that we really we feel we feel it because in Somalia it's really very rare to get at some environmental activists. It's just a, a couple of uh, of people that are really uh, campaigning and advocating the environment. Uh, the sec the third thing that really we feel is that a fragile government, a fragile government, uh, the Somali government is a fragile government that really dealing a lot of problems. So. It's really uh, very hard to focus on. Uh, I mean, to focus on the 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 implementation activists because it it really needs a support from the government, uh, and the government is a variable. It can really it cannot done a lot about the environment if it's al alternative energy or, or if it's uh, uh, planting mass mass trees on the uh, uh, on the environment or so. Uh, and the main, the last one that really we we felt is that uh, limited local information. People, people have a, a limited information about the environment and uh, how their activities, the activities they are doing, is affecting the environment. And it's really sometimes hard to, uh, of course, to uh, uh, convince them that their their activities is really not go to the environment and it's really stop. Uh, so those are the main problems that we really encounter during our activity. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. And we are very sorry for the challenges that we are facing. Of course, we know uh, in Somalia, there are some areas which are held by the extremists and they are controlled. Therefore, uh, it's somehow challenging to introduce uh, these climate change uh, programs. And of course, uh, you need people with capacity in order to implement those programs. Uh, uh, going back to Nadine, we have heard uh, from Priyanka and Faisa their challenges that they are facing. Uh, maybe we would love to hear from you. Uh, are there any challenges uh, that you are facing in your um, uh, uh, this uh, climate change activism? Uh, but I would like to remind uh, participants that Nadine, apart from being uh, environmental and human rights activist, is also a classical trained opera singer. Therefore, today we have a classical trained opera singer. Nadine, you are welcome to share your uh, uh, challenge that you're facing. Thank you for that fun fact, Jonas. I appreciate you sharing. Um, well, first I have to acknowledge that my activism as a white cisgendered woman in the United States is very different than the experience of my counterparts who are of the global majority and in places like where Faisal is right now or where Priyanka is. So there's, there's a radical difference in the challenges that I face, which are like, I, I feel grateful because I my government, um, which it has its problems certainly, um, but I, I have the ability to speak out actively against what is happening just being an activist in the US, for the most part, you're safe. And that is not the case for so many children and youth activists around the globe. Um, but here in my context, a challenge I've encountered 
is often spaces where decision making happens feel more like getting into an exclusive club rather than open civic engagement. So in, in some cases, I've experienced very technocratic forms of youth engagement that felt more like checking off a youth engagement box and you're wearing your youth hat. So you're saying things from the perspective of youth, not from the perspective of a person. Um, and so more that that can just that it feels more technocratic than really meaningful intergenerational partnership. So often I think the the challenges are breaking out of viewing youth as simply the youth perspective, but really those that will inherit the earth that we're living in currently, we will inherit the state of affairs and we have the least amount of decision-making power. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine, for sharing uh, your experience. Of course, in many government uh, authorities, uh, youth are given a small space in decision-making Therefore, it's a challenge to most of the uh, nations. Um, I would like to go back to Pfizer. Pfizer, you have been living in a country uh, with uh, full of, um, it is a war-torn uh, country and you have been successfully growing in that country, uh, taking up your studies from second level uh, up to uh, university. Uh, can you tell us what are the main impact of the climate uh, crisis on children and youth uh, from your perspective? Uh, well, uh, it has a, it has really a lot of impacts uh, and, and the main impact is that really we currently face or we currently, we currently face, uh, feel in Somalia is mainly about droughts and floods. Those are the two main things that we currently uh, actually feel, and both of of, of these uh, consequences uh, are have a really great re re detrimental effects on on the people, especially children and and women in Somalia. Uh, uh, really, uh, the uh, like the main impacts that that they really feel children and 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 of course. Uh, youth in Somalia is when when climate crisis occur they actually get it like like it's it really impacts their education uh, or their healthy facilities or or it really of, of course impacts their life how they really uh, like uh, how they are really living uh, their their life uh, for example the floods uh, some floods that have been occurred in Balatwene, it has really caused to displace many, uh, uh, of course, uh, many uh, families. They displace it from their origin place to uh, another uh, place. And we really, of course, it has even caused uh, 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 some families to really die, their parents, and, and, the, um, and of course, the children get of course, uh, they really they gotta they they are apart from the family, and it ha and that really caused to, uh, of course, to become like a child labor or or just to street uh, to street, uh, and also it has really an impact to their health. You know, children and 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 of course, especially children has more vul vulnerable to uh, have and impacted than adults uh, because for example children is uh has they really uh i mean they really breathe twice than adults so for that reason they really of course more susceptible to get uh, pneumonia like uh eye pollution diseases uh and sometimes it happens in, in somalia and for lot is for lot is it really has an impact. I, I can't tell one history that has happened in Makadisho. Uh, it's really uh, a current in Makadisho. Uh, and I, of course, I've seen it, some of the parents that have felt it. And that's really, sometimes there's an un unpredictable raining in Makadisho and, and it has really caused the more flood from that, from that heavy raining. And 
you know, Mercedes streets are uh, has not really a, a drained a well drained system, and and that really causes the water to the the floods to drain or really to drain from high land to low land, and the low land is, is uh, uh, sometimes there are some families that are I mean a uh, 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 poor families that really uh, uh, live in uh, old houses and. And that floods really hit to to the yeah to uh to the water I mean to the house and they get into the to the water they didn't get some of course help and okay. and five like almost five kids has been drawn it in the water five kids in that place it was such a horrible uh, uh history that I really got during my climate activism and it's something that really uh causing by the of course, uh, climate change, and the main thing okay. that I can that I would like to say is climate change is not is not the problem. The problem is the global warming. Global warming, and the global warming is caused by the human activities, and it really would be great to, uh, of course, to stop that. It's just a signal. Climate change is just a signal, and the problem is the global warming, and we have to really focus on that area. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Faisa. Uh, for well uh, uh, articulated uh, explanation on the impact of uh, youth. Uh, of course, you have said well that uh, youth are adversely impacted. Um, they, they, they can't go to school to have education. Their health systems are not well set when there is flooding, when there is global warming. Therefore, we thank you for, uh, for such piecemeal of um, of uh, explanations. And you have said well that uh, climate change may bring diseases like pneumonia. As I remember in 2020, UNICEF uh, hosted the World uh, Leaders Forum, a global forum on children uh, on pneumonia. It is the first international forum of such kind. Therefore, it seems pneumonia has increased due to climate change. Uh, going back to Priyanka, uh, Priyanka, uh, people in humanitarian settings and the conflict affected area experience larger impact of climate uh, crisis. Uh, what are the climate uh, impact, climate crisis impact on youth or, and children in your, in your settings? Thank you for this question. Children and young people contribute the least to climate change, yet they suffer tremendously and often they suffer in silence. Here in Trinidad and Tobago, we are seeing and we are feeling the impact of climate change more than ever. And we are experiencing temperature increases and changing precipitation patterns. And with droughts, increased rainfall, often off season, flash flooding is extreme, along with landslides, sea level rise and coastal erosion. And I too can share my own experience. When I was six years old, I experienced the impact of a flash flood in my primary school. While there was no physical harm to students, many experienced anxiety and trauma every time it rained. And children across all levels of society are affected by heat waves and dust. Asthma and allergies to dust is common in Trinidad and Tobago and in the wider Caribbean as well. And those in lower socioeconomic levels and in informal communities are severely impacted when there are flash floods and natural disasters, the damage and loss to property, livestock, farms, crops and water supplies, and even personal items such as school books and uniforms set these families back year after year. The threat to health is a tragedy for children and young people who are adversely affected by climate change. Flood waters contaminate water supplies and damage crops that they rely on for their meals. The floods put them at risk for both vector and insect-borne diseases, and the precarious position leaves their parents cash-strapped and unable to provide nutritious, well-balanced meals. The triple burden of malnutrition is glaring amongst this group. They suffer from undernutrition, micronutrient deficiencies, and non-communicable diseases, child obesity, diabetes, hypertension, fatigue, and even depression are directly related to their poor diets and living conditions. And the COVID-19 pandemic has worsened their position. 
we are witnessing children and young people becoming increasingly more vulnerable as the threats to their safety and their well being are mounting due to climate change. When it floods and homes are destroyed, many children are separated from their families. The disruption in children's physical and social environments are stressful, and they are separated from their parents, their homes, and they are put in vulnerable situations, and they're often disoriented disoriented um, and they lose interest in school and for many children especially those in lower socioeconomic levels and informal communities their place of ref refuge is school and at home they get the only balanced at school they get the only balanced meal or the only meal of the day their homes are often volatile with domestic abuse their communities are in crime hotspots and when they are out of school many are at the hands of caregivers who themselves are abusers and this can have potentially severe and long-term mental health consequences. The devastation in the Eastern Caribbean caused by 2017 hurricane season brought many of these children protection issues to the fore and in Trinidad and Tobago residents in the Granville area experienced unexpected flooding in October 2018. Many never returned their homes as losses were so massive children and young people feel hopeless in these situations. I sent my own books and clothing to help replenish what was lost, but only when we can mitigate and adapt to the threats of climate change can we make any meaningful progress to build resilient communities and that are so harshly impacted by climate change. And in my country, flash flooding often affects the same year, areas year after year. And as a result, those affected seem to be trapped in the cycle of poverty, reduced access to education, high rates in youth unemployment, and which sometimes leads to the life of trauma, substance abuse, and crime. And this is a tragedy as assault is leading cause of death among 15 to 24 year olds in the Caribbean. In Trinidad and Tobago and in many other Caribbean islands, there's a high prevalence of sexual violence and domestic abuse. Many girls and young women were heightened risk of these forms of child rights violations. And regionally, there are high levels of incest, sexual violence and child pregnancies. Urgent intervention is required to build more resilient infrastructure and to educate all levels of society to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Very often, those affected contribute very little to their outcomes. Thank you very much. You're muted, Jonas. Oh, uh, thank you, Priyanka, for, uh, for the story that you have shared. It's really painful, and we are very sorry for the, for the people in Trinidad uh, Trinidad and Tobago for the loss of the, their properties. And of course, uh, we are glad to hear that you, uh, you took part in helping them provision of food, provision of books, your own books. Therefore, congratulations for helping them. Of course, flash flood uh, usually brings impact to the, to, to the children and, and youth. Uh, when flood comes, then uh, uh, many properties are destroyed. It can, they can be books uh, or home calls and other articles at home. Therefore, flash flood is very uh, destructive. Uh, before uh, going uh, on with the session, I would like to remind that we have uh, the chat box. We continue to receive uh, comments, we receive uh, questions. Therefore, if you have any question, uh, put in the chat box and later on at the end, we will pick some of the question and for them to be answered by our panelists. Uh, Nadine, um, what do you think that as a the child practitioner, you know, we have many child practitioners today. Uh, what do you think is the child practitioner could do uh, to keep in mind while trying to mitigate the child protection risks uh, as a result of this climate crisis? Mm, well, thank you for the question. And first, I have to thank all of the child practitioners who are here today. I mean, that you are here means you're already committed to the well-being of children and youth. And I think that that's a very powerful thing, powerful way to show up in the world. So um, much gratitude. But in, you know, in the climate space, I think just continuing to amplify the 
the voices and the lived experiences of young people and those who are on the front lines of climate change, um, really creating space as well where there is none for meaningful intergenerational partnership. So wherever it is that you may be also trying to seek to, to shift the, the underlying ethos from which we operate across all the circles you are in. And I, I often choose to see climate change as a symptom of a much greater illness. And that illness is an ethic of extraction. It's an ethic of exploitation, both of humans and of ecosystems. Um, and it's, it's an ethic of lack of care. It's one that prioritizes profit over people and over ecosystems and climate change is simply a symptom. Um, so seeking to, to shift more into an ethic of care and of compassion um, and centering the well-being of seven generations down the line from now, as many Indigenous scholars um, often cite. So um, just really also holding, holding space for, for young people and people of all generations for the pain, the anxiety, the numbness, the overwhelm anger and of course now eco anxiety that's emerging that young people are feeling um, seek to inspire hope but also be sure to sit with them through these big emotions that come up uh, because often often feelings need to be felt otherwise they just get trapped um, and most importantly extend your your calls and valiant efforts for protection um, of youth to the natural world and in many languages, there's no separation between us as mankind and nature. Yet our mother earth has no legal protections. So by working to protect our ecosystems, protecting our fellow species um, and doing so from a place of love, that's, that is key to long-term sustainability of our species and ensuring that there is a world that is safe, that is inhabitable for young people to live in. Um, and also, also acknowledging that not all contexts are exactly the same. So thinking, you know, hearing Priyanka speak, especially um, reflecting on what you were sharing, even in the US, there is an enormous spectrum of different experiences with the climate crisis. And so there are, there are communities that have way more adverse exposure to things like environmental health inequities, whether it's polluted waterways or um, you know, polluted soil or exposure to harmful chemicals from proximity to fracking sites, from proximity to factories and those sort of large operations. So really seeking to look at the, the nuanced differences in each community and looking for the best access points for intervention and also just showing up and showing up as you are to listen and to hold space for the young people in your lives, in your community, because um, it's it's a really painful, uncertain crossroads that we're standing at right now. But I actually have an enormous amount of hope. Uh, I think you know, as as humans, we and we're seeing this with the pandemic too. We are not good at prevention, very bad at it, um, especially in the U.S. Not good at prevention, but we're good at responding. And I think now that we're seeing more and more of the impacts of climate change, and unfortunately, you know, it's gonna take people who are in power um, experiencing firsthand some of what's happening with the climate crisis to really get it. But I think that we are a lot more responsive um, as humans than we are oriented towards prevention. So still keep doing all the amazing work you're doing with prevention um, and encourage those to see its benefits so that we're not just reacting to something, but rather um, avoiding more harmful consequences. But thank you. Thank you, thank you, Nadine. Uh, as Chadi practitioner will continue, we'll stop working, we'll not stop working in uh, protecting children. Uh, thank you for the insights, it's true. Uh, that is a charity practitioner should continue to inspire and amplify the voice and also to, as a legal practitioner, at least to draft legal measures uh, to, to mitigate the impact of, uh, of uh, climate crisis and uh, impact of conflicts uh, to children and youth. Uh, coming back to Faisal, uh, what do you think 
uh, these child practitioners who are here uh, should keep in mind while trying to mitigate the, uh, the risks that children are facing in climate crisis. What, what are they supposed to do? Uh, well, uh, of course, Nadine has almost really said it, almost really, really said it, but I would like to add some points that, that really uh, child practitioners should keep in mind when they are in humanitarian uh, uh, tasks. Uh, I would like to really first start that. Uh, thank you very much for your hard commitment and dedication on helping to, uh, uh, of course, to you, I um, mean, to children is, uh, that is really such a great uh, thing. And you should really guys to, uh, uh, you deserve to, uh, I mean, for the hard work you're doing. Uh, and what I would like to say is, uh, I mean, humanitarian uh, organizations uh, should really keep in mind, like when they are doing in, uh, in activities that some of their may it might it might happen that some of their activities that they are doing might have an eff effect on the environment. For example, uh, some uh, organs, some child protection organizations like MCHs or um, or like health centers, they that really work in remote areas. They really use mostly diesel generators. So it, instead, it's better than to use alternative energy like solar system that's really more environmental, uh, uh, of course, friendly and less costly. Uh, and also they can really uh, think about it. I mean, to use less peppers, you know, some, you know, some activities that really might, that, that, that's been done by the child, uh, child, uh, I mean, child protection organization is, they can really be part of the, of mitigating climate change. You know, like if they, really think about trying to do less papers, you know, or, you know, when they are uh, shipping to some humanitarian things to, to the people to use less papers, it's really quite fine. At least it can really add something to the environment. Uh, and also really, uh, even rather than using papers, it's really better than to use PDFs, you know, digital PDFs. There's another idea that, that re really they might think about it. Uh, and, and of course, the main important thing that I would like to say is people really, I mean, I mean those who, who they are really serving, I mean, uh, they really need information and, and knowledge in weather forecasting. Uh, I really know some, uh, of course, some farmers, they really have a problem on the unpredictability of the weather. They, when they really try to, of course, uh, I have a, of course, uh, farmers and or really try to do some vegetables. Uh, there is an unpredictability that really might not give some, uh, of course, a variable condition to the environment that they really might think that this, like this weather is really good. Like they try to, of course, uh, farm uh, sorghum. They, they really think that it's gonna happen three like three months, but it might happen sometimes to get a five months of dry land. So it's really nice to give some local information that can help them, which is really very important. And the final thing that I would like to add is child, uh, I mean, a strong child protection system might really uh, give some resilience to them because it might it really prevent abuses or net abuse, neglected trafficking, other related harms that children face as a result of droughts, floods. So it's really good idea to have a strong system that when it happens, the problem that might have, of course, uh, that might give some variable resiliency to those who are affected by the, Thank you. by the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal, for giving us uh, uh, that insight. Of course, information and knowledge uh, of weather forecasting is very important because the parents will have a uh, time uh, to protect their children. They will have to predict that next year or next season flood will come next year. Maybe there'll be hunger 
uh, there will be no food. So they will find a solution uh, to find uh, ways to have food or to keep food, to reserve some food for the next season. Therefore, you have talked uh, that point, uh, which is very, very important. Information and knowledge of weather forecasting is very, very important. Uh, coming uh, to Priyanka, as you know, uh, climate crisis is like a new area in within the Alliance and its members. Uh, and also youth is like a new component within the Alliance. We would like to know how can the Alliance uh, and its member uh, can better engage with young people on climate agenda? How we youth can be well involved in the climate agenda, agenda within the Alliance? Thank you for this question. I think education is key. The knowledge gap between experts and policymakers and those affected is huge. Our experts, researchers, policymakers have all the data, the statistics, the findings and the solutions, but it is meaningless unless it is in the hands of those who are directly affected and the children and the young people. Information must be read by the people in lower socioeconomic levels through community outreach programs and education. Special attention must be paid to educating girls and young women who are homemakers and who are often solely responsible for raising children. Families need to be taught green skills. How to collect and store water is critical to mitigating against vector and insect-borne diseases. We seem to be able to act to help those affected, which is secondary prevention, but we must work towards strengthening child protection efforts to reduce risks. Therefore, primary prevention is critical. Increased efforts may all, must also be made in tertiary protection prevention as this seems to be the most lagging. And I think it's also so important to include the youth voice, to have intergenerational dialogue, to have intergenerational decision-making. Our young people, our children, this generation is feeling the impact of climate change and so will our future generations if we don't do something now. But we also need our leaders in society. We need our parents, we need our mentors, we need those who came before us to guide us and teach us. It's about having that intergenerational co connect because we need to work in solidarity if we want to truly combat this crisis. And I think it's also so important to include um, programs and curriculums like this in schools, even from kindergarten all the way up to secondary school. I think it's so important for young people and children to understand the problem we are facing, but also what they must do to help adapt and mitigate, but also not showing them the destruction and everything negative that's happening, but giving them a sign of hope that they have the power, empowering them to make the change and giving them a sense of hopefulness that together we can do this and together we can adapt to climate change and move towards a brighter future in solidarity. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Priyanka for uh, giving us insights uh, about um, how can uh, Alliance involve or engage youth. Uh, for one minute, can you share with us Nadine, how can Alliance engage us youth within uh, within the alliance thank you um i'd say a really important way of engaging youth is as full partners is not seeing youth as youth but rather as people with lived experiences and perspectives um, for me personally i see youth as being so incredibly imaginative and we're often not as as jaded by the, the real world although young people are on the front lines of climate change but rather engaging youth as, as thinkers, as scholars, as people who are capable of envisioning the future that they seek to create, and then showing up as the Alliance saying, okay, then how can we help you get there? Um, and I think it really, it starts with questions. It starts with good, good questions rather than prescriptive answers. And I know the Alliance is wonderful at being a partner in provoking good questioning. So I think really just working one on one, working in tandem um, and uplifting the voices of the young people who are experiencing the front lines of climate change um, and being able to sit through the a lot of the discomfort that comes with the world that we're in today. 
um, and holding space for the complexity and um, really helping communicate out to the world the, the interlinkages that exist between justice issues, between child's rights issues and gender equality, between child's rights issues and responsible consumption and production. Looking at, I, I love to look at the SDGs not as 17 silos, but as a web of interconnected components and finding the points of intervention between various issues of justice and um, really seeking to to uplift the young people who are who are doing the, the work at those intersections. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Nadine, for the insights. It's true that uh, youth should be involved, uh, not as listeners, but as uh, think tankers. Therefore, if Alliance wish to benefit from youth, they have to involve and they have to work one on one with youth, not only as listeners, but as a think tanker. And of course, I, I, I got a point from Priyanka that um, we youth, uh, when we, we have a inter, we call intergenerational dialogue with, uh, with adults, we can bring uh, something which is so precious and so useful in, in the Alliance. Therefore, I'm happy today that uh, this forum and uh, this Alliance annual meeting uh, is one of the intergenerational intergenerational dialogue because uh, we have people like Mikiko, uh, Xavier, uh, we have people like Audley, they are adults and we youth are involved in, therefore it is part of an intergenerational dialogue. Uh, thank you so much, my dear panelists. Uh, we are not closing, but we want to go to Q&A session uh, Q&A session, and please, uh, Julie, uh, can you help us to, uh, to, to, to assist us to, to, to explain how are we uh, selecting the questions from the, uh, from the chat box or from the group map? Julie? Absolutely. Thank you, Jonas, and thank you, panelists. So on the screen, you should be able to see all of the questions that have come in so far. So I'm just going to move everybody to this step. So if you haven't yet, please do click on that group map link. And then to vote for which question you'd like to have answered first, just go over to the right hand side and click on the plus sign. OK, so if you can start doing that now, we've had a few likes. Um, which is awesome. Uh, but if you want to do a quick vote, just so everybody here, there's a hundred participants in addition to our panel. Um, so if you'd all like to come in and cast your vote now, uh, we can have a look at the results as they come in. And we'll just give you a minute, give you a minute. Actually, you stay there. I'll move us onto the results page just so we can see it will keep updating live. Okay, so let me see what votes are coming in first. Okay, so top vote at the moment, our group works on protecting children from violence and abuse during climate disaster or conflict. Yet our daily work has an impact on the climate crisis. What are some whoop, tips you would give us as humanitarian responders to balance the needs today with the needs tomorrow? That's still at the top. Oh, just moved a second. <laughs> well, good. They're they're coming in strong, so I'll leave this up for you, Jonas, and you can just take it away. Are you able to zoom in, Julie, so it's a little bit um, easier to read? Yes. Although you're gonna miss some of that one, but let's zoom in a bit. Whoop. How's that? The, the ones with the most votes will keep moving up. Yes, we have only got a couple minutes left. Jonas, do you want to take us away with the first question? Oh, thank you. Uh, the first question says, uh, and please, uh, Priyanka, be ready to respond first. What do you think uh, child protection workers should do more to mitigate the negative impact of climate change? One minute, please. 
Yes, thank you for this question. As I mentioned, I think it's all about the inclusion, including young people from all different sectors of society, including young girls, including people from different cultural backgrounds, including young people and having that sense of intergenerational change. You can only truly make an impact if you hear from the people who are being affected, hear from the young people of tomorrow, hear from us as agents for change. We have ideas, we have missions, and we have solutions of our own that we want to see implemented in society but I think it can only really be pushed into the way we live and into our economies and our societies through the help of our adults, our parents, our child protection workers, our authority figures, our organizations. So of course it's up to that intergenerational um, work, that intergenerational dialogue, intergenerational solidarity, and also giving young people platforms like this, giving them radio stations, local TV stations, blogs, social media platforms where they can speak up and advocate for the issues affecting them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. Yeah. Uh, what are the good practices? Uh, this question goes to Pfizer. What are the good practices you have experienced when adults have collaborated with young people and what helpful approaches should we avoid? Pfizer. What, uh, what are the good practices you have experienced in your, in your settings or in your community? when adults have collaborated with young people? Uh, actually, uh, I would really like to say uh, the good practices that, of course, that I experienced it. Uh, I would like, like, I would really say is that, uh, you know, the willingness, willingness to do uh, the things that, that, is, that is more important to the environment, yeah, uh, and that's really good practice because, uh, because the like the uh, the youth is that really that I that I'm working with them, they are like more willing to do it and like they are more energetic and more uh, youthfulness to do it. So uh, that is the things that I would like to say. It yeah, thank you. Okay, thank yeah. you, thank you. Uh... I've got uh, uh, a word from you that experience matters a lot. Experience yeah. matters a lot. Nadim, uh, in our group works on protecting children and youth uh, from violence and abuse, uh, but yet our daily activities, our daily works uh, has an impact on climate crisis. What are the tips you would give us as humanitarian responder to balance our needs uh, of today and the needs of tomorrow? Well, I, I really appreciate this question as I think it covers a lot of different areas. Um, first, I have to note that I, am, I myself am not a safeguarding specialist in disaster zones, so I can't speak specifically to um, this scope of work, but um, in terms of looking at, you know, the, the needs of tomorrow balanced with, um, with today, I'd say really just looking at what, what solutions, what policies are needed to get us from point A to point B and advocating fervently for those. So thinking about the world that we want to live in. And I often, um, during lectures and workshops, will talk about reform as reimagination. So even in these settings, um, seeking to look towards what is the future that we want to build together and how do we get there um, rather than often I feel like we can get bogged down in the minutia of um, the difficulties that we're moving through and so I'd say um, yeah really really looking at um, a very future facing approach of how how can we get to a certain place um, and also similarly to what Faisal and Priyanka have shared just amplifying the voices of young people, but doing so in a way where young people feel that they have uh, a space that's safe in order to share the work that they're doing. And especially in places where youth climate activists are um, under threat, it's really showing up for and protecting them and providing that, um, 
that space for them to be able to, to do the work that they do. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for your answers, beautiful answers. We had so many questions, beautiful questions, but due to uh, time limitations, we, uh, we are unable to continue responding to all the questions, but I hope the, the organizers have seen the questions, they, they will find the answers. And uh, before going back to Audley, I would like to say thank you, our dear panelists and all the commentators and those who asked questions. Of course, they did a great job. Uh, let's clap hands for them, for the dear panelists. Faisa, Priyanka, Nadine. You can use your reaction button uh, in the bottom of your <laughs> page if you want yes, to clap your yes, hands. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I give the opportunity to Audley to, to continue. Fantastic. And thank you so much uh, to you, Jonas, for this great uh, moderation of this uh, discussion. I had the feeling that we could have stayed together uh, endlessly, and we have just opened the discussion uh, today. We will obviously uh, look at the questions and try to find a way, not sure we have the answer yet, but at least um, to see how those can potentially become guiding questions. Um, being cautious of the time, I would like to thank everyone, Mrs. Otani, Mr. Castellanos, uh, Jonas, Nadine, Priyanka, and Faisal for, for their wisdom, for their intervention, uh, for their words. Uh, we look forward to continuing uh, the collaboration with all of you at different level and different time moving forward the next year. For the time being, we're going to break for a few minutes. I think we restart at 3.20, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so in about 16 minutes, so you have time to stretch, have a cup of coffee, tea, whatever. Um, and we will come back. Uh, uh, to get the opportunity now to listen to child protection practitioners and get some example of the work that is already done at the at the field level, um, another another set of uh, great um, discussion. Looking ahead, sorry, it's Friday afternoon on my side. Um, another round of applause before we switch off. Thank you so much, everyone. Super interesting, super informative. And we meet uh, in 16 minutes now. Bye. <laughs>